In the fall of 1995, a serial killer was on the loose. Crossing the country, he lured women with his charm and then struck. Each time, he vanished before police could catch him. The FBI and police detectives needed to stop him before another victim met this deadly stranger. The body of a young woman found burned in a truck launched a manhunt to find her killer. When more bodies began to turn up across the country, the FBI believed the cases were linked. Investigators had a suspect. They just couldn't find him. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents would enlist the help of local law enforcement and even long-haul truckers to stop a cross-country killer. In the early morning hours of September 29th, 1995, the Los Angeles Fire Department responded to a vehicle fire at a hospital in Van Nuys. They found a pickup truck burning in the parking lot. When the flames were extinguished, they found human remains. Firemen contacted the Arson and Homicide Division of the Los Angeles Police Department. Homicide detectives responded to the scene and were briefed by uniformed officers already there. They questioned a witness, a nurse who had seen the fire start. She said she had arrived for work before dawn for the early morning shift. In the parking lot, she saw the truck go ablaze. She saw the outline of a figure with long hair run from the truck as the flames erupted. She never saw a face. And she had never seen the truck before. Investigators inspected the vehicle. The pattern of fire damage indicated it had begun in the cab and had burned very quickly. Investigators believed it had been intentionally set. An accelerant had been used, probably gasoline. The body inside appeared to be a female, but it was burned beyond recognition. Some items survived the fire, including a backpack, a camera, and a roll of undeveloped film. Technicians recovered several documents that bore the name Sandra Gallagher. By sunrise, detectives at LAPD's Van Nuys station had run the truck's plates. Okay, I'll, I'll call back. Through DMV records, Detective Mike Koblenz was able to confirm that Sandra Gallagher owned the truck. We'd done some work at the office and learned that uh, she was, in fact, married to uh, an individual, Steve, who lived in the Los Angeles area. We attempted to contact him and made arrangements to interview him at uh, Van Nuys Station. Detectives suspected it was Sandra in the truck, but identification through dental records would take a few days. Since the body was too damaged to identify, detectives asked Stephen Gallagher to look through the recovered evidence. He said the backpack, camera, and other items were Sandra's. The 
police department had developed a roll of film that survived the fire. Stephen identified his wife in the pictures. Most married homicide victims are killed by their husbands. Detectives asked Stephen about his relationship with Sandra. There's a lot of domestic violence, spousal abuse that goes on, so it's, it's, it's just a, a, a direction to go to initially. In our case, as it related to Sandra Gallagher, uh, once again, we wanted to eliminate the husband as a suspect and determine a little bit more about our victim, Sandra. Stephen said he had seen his wife on September 28th, the day before the truck fire. That day, the couple had met for lunch. He and Sandra were experiencing marital problems, and they had spent the last couple of nights apart. They had talked about reconciling. But things were still strained between them. Okay. Stephen told detectives he last saw Sandra around 2 p.m., though he heard from his wife later that evening. He said Sandra called him from a local bar called McGrath's. I know, I know. She was very excited and told him she had won $1,200 in the lottery. Since that call, Stephen hadn't heard from his wife and had no idea where she had gone. There were a few other people. Uh, Detectives had to corroborate his story. Once he mentioned the Bar McReds, that was our direction. We wanted to get in there, find out who was the bartender, who the owner was, who was there that particular evening, and who could identify some photos of Sandra that we gathered from the truck. LAPD detectives visited the bar. When shown a photo of Sandra Gallagher, the bartender recognized the woman. What can you tell me about her? She knew her by her nickname, Sam. Guess what? The bartender confirmed that Sandra had been in the bar on the night of the 28th. She had told everyone about her lottery win. Some customers overheard the detective's questions and said they had also been in McGred's that evening. Can you tell me about her when she was in here the other night? They also remembered Sandra and recalled one man who talked with her that night. These people in the bar had mentioned to us that uh, they recognized the photographs and they identified the photographs as a female by the name of Sam. This is the uh, name that they knew her by, was Sam. And everybody had mentioned she was with a person by the name of Glenn. Yeah. They described Glenn as having long blonde hair and a beard. He'd been coming in regularly for the past few days. That night, he seemed interested in Sandra and talked to her for quite a while. Okay. Glenn was friendly and came across as a big spender, buying drinks for Sandra and the others. When the bar closed, Glenn had asked Sandra for a ride home. He said he lived nearby. She agreed to drop him off, and they left together. The customers hadn't seen Glenn since that it? night. Yeah, she took him home. Do you know where he went? They believed Glenn's last name was Rogers, but they weren't sure. Their description of him matched the one of the man seen fleeing the burning truck. If you think of anything else, please call me. Detective Koblenz would check the lead. Through department sources, we were able to identify Glenn Rogers as a resident in the Van Nuys area. And we were able to obtain photographs of Mr. Rogers. These photographs, in the next day or two, 
were shown to various witnesses at the bar in the form of a photo lineup and Mr. Rogers was identified in this photo lineup as a person being at McRed's with Sandra Gallagher. Detectives secured a search warrant for Rogers' apartment. It was only a few minutes away from where the truck had been burned. LAPD, search warrant! They didn't know if Rogers was inside, perhaps with a weapon. Uniformed officers entered first to clear the apartment. Rogers wasn't there. It looked like Rogers had cleared out in a hurry. Detectives recovered a purse and a woman's wallet. It was empty of cash and held no ID. No identification. They also found a woman's earring. The earring became significant in that uh, her husband, Steve Gallagher, identified that earring as one that he had purchased as a pair for uh, his wife a couple months earlier. After several days, the coroner made his report. He positively identified the remains from the truck as those of Sandra Gallagher. He determined that she had not burned to death. We learn in the nose area of our victim, there wasn't any presence of evidence of fire, sooting, and so on. That gave us information that uh, because she didn't breathe any of the fire, any of the soot, it gave us an indication that uh, she had died prior to the fire itself. The mother of three had been killed by manual strangulation. Los Angeles detectives charged Glenn Rogers with Sandra Gallagher's murder and issued a warrant for his arrest. They entered Rogers' name and description into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, a database that links over 57,000 law enforcement agencies nationwide. That informs other agencies around the United States that Glenn Rogers, in this case, is in fact wanted in Los Angeles for murder. It would list the agency, Los Angeles Police Department, Van Nuys area, with my name and my phone number. If they have any contact with Glenn Rogers and happen to run him, this warrant would show up uh, in their jurisdiction and he'd be taken into custody. Detectives sought out anyone who knew Glenn Rogers. They learned he frequented local bars and worked odd jobs, mostly in construction. They visited several job sites, interviewing his friends and co-workers. Through witnesses and friends, we learned that Glenn uh, did have a temper, and that when he drank, he did become enraged. There was domestic uh, violence involved with uh, former girlfriends. So we knew we were dealing with someone who could become violent, and generally violent when he drank, as it was in our case with Sandra Gallagher. One of his friends said he hadn't seen Rogers in a while, but promised to contact the police if he heard from him. Okay. A few days later, Rogers' friend called. He said Rogers had phoned him from a motel outside Jackson, Mississippi. Local police talked to the motel manager, who told them Rogers' room number. Open up. The room was empty. The murder suspect was on the run. In the fall of 1995, the search continued for Glenn Rogers. Police believed he fled California after killing a woman there on September 28th. 
tip led to a Mississippi motel. But Rogers had disappeared before police arrived. Police issued an APB locally. They hoped someone would spot the suspected killer before he left the area. Days later, on November 3rd, 1995, Jackson, Mississippi detectives responded to a murder. Family members had found Linda Price dead in her bathtub. The 34-year-old single mother had been stabbed repeatedly and her throat had been slashed. Investigators searched the apartment for evidence. Technicians photographed the scene and lifted numerous latent fingerprints. They found no murder weapon. No valuables seemed to be missing. There was no apparent forced entry, and the killer had locked the door when leaving. The details of the crime scene led Jackson homicide detectives to conclude Linda Price had been killed by someone she knew. In the morning, they interviewed her mother. Perhaps she knew the killer as well. She said her daughter had a new boyfriend. His name was Glenn Rogers. A month earlier, on October 3rd, Linda had met Rogers at the Mississippi State Fair where he had been working. He was charming, and Linda fell for him right away. They soon rented an apartment and moved in together. At first, Linda seemed happier than ever, but recently she wondered if she'd made a mistake. She told her mother that Rogers had a bad temper and she feared his mood swings. When Linda stopped calling and didn't answer her apartment door, her mother believed that Rogers had harmed her. Again, Rogers was nowhere to be found. Jackson detectives believed he had left the area. They entered his name into the NCIC database. Learning Rogers was wanted for murder in California, they contacted Detective Mike Koblenz in Los Angeles. Jackson, Mississippi at that time contacted me, informed me of a murder they had, and they wanted more information on Glenn Rogers as he was a possible perpetrator in that case. The murders followed a pattern. The victims in California and Mississippi had both been charmed by Rogers. They had been isolated from others, then brutally killed just before Rogers fled the area. The investigators believed that Rogers was on a rampage that probably would not stop until he was found. In our minds, we knew that we had a major problem going on here. We felt if he wasn't apprehended, that there could very well be more victims. Jackson police asked the public to call if anyone saw Rogers in the area. Witnesses reported sightings, but Rogers stayed one step ahead of authorities. The detectives contacted the FBI field office in Jackson. They believed Rogers had left the state like he did after the California killing. Agents filed a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Perhaps federal resources could help stop the killer. FBI Special Agent John Huber helped coordinate the multi-state investigation. Well, this case was very high speed, very fast. The murder he committed in Jackson was on November 3rd, it was Linda Price. 
Um, subsequent to that, he committed another murder on November 6th. On that date, police in Tampa, Florida, responded to a murder scene at a local motel room that had been rented by Glenn Rogers. Like Linda Price, the young woman lay dead in the bathtub, stabbed in the back, chest, and wrist. There was no ID of the woman in the room, but investigators noted a tattoo of a cross on her shoulder. Her jeans and shoes were piled near the toilet. A bracelet was found in the sink. From the evidence left behind, Tampa homicide detective Julie Masucci attempted to piece together the details of the murder. When we removed the clothing, it appeared that she had been stabbed through the clothing, which means that she was never undressed. Um, and it was from the rear portion, which appeared that someone might have come up behind her and stabbed her. The shoes had blood spots on the top, indicating she had them on and was standing when she was attacked. Under her body was a man's watch. Investigators believed it belonged to the killer. It was significant that she was placed in a bathtub and that it appeared that someone tried to clean up any evidence that they left behind. We had found towels to indicate someone had wiped up blood off of a floor. Um, it appeared that the bathtub water had been run to try and clean up any evidence that was left behind. The detective interviewed the housekeeper who discovered the body. That morning, she had been making her daily rounds just after checkout time. Outside room 119, she spotted a handwritten Do Not Disturb sign. Housekeeping! She said she didn't clean the room the day before because she saw the sign and wanted to respect the privacy of the people staying there. On this day, the occupants were scheduled to have checked out. When she entered the bathroom, she made the gruesome discovery. Detectives asked the motel manager if she knew about the people staying in room 119. She recalled the man who rented the room because he requested a do not disturb sign the day before. They told him he didn't have one. So he paid for another night and told them at the registration that he did not want them cleaning his room. He wanted it to be left alone. Apparently, he went back to the room and tore off a piece of a phone book and made his own do not disturb sign, and he hung it on the door. The motel manager remembered the same man packing up a small white car that evening. He had paid for another night, so she didn't think he was leaving. She warned him about recent break-ins at the motel and told him not to leave anything in the car overnight. The detectives checked the office records, finding the registration card for room 119. It had Glenn Rogers' name and signature on it. Technicians would later recover prints matching Rogers from the car. Detective Masucci ran a computer check and saw the California and Mississippi murder warrants. She contacted the other agencies and the FBI. Then we started to realize very quickly into the investigation that there was a possibility that this man, Mr. Glenn Rogers, was a serial killer. The investigators knew who the killer was, but Tampa detectives still had not identified the female victim. She remained at the morgue as Jane Doe. 
If they could identify her, it might help them find the man who had killed her and at least two others. In the fall of 1995, after linking murders in California, Mississippi, and Florida to one man, the FBI and local detectives searched for accused serial killer, Glenn Rogers. The latest victim had been found in a Tampa motel room. She was still unidentified. Responding to media coverage, a woman whose daughter had been missing for two days came forward. She positively identified the body of her daughter, Tina Marie Cribbs. Tina had two children of her own. Tina's mother told Detective Julie Masucci about her daughter's last day. We learned that Tina had worked and that she went to the Showtime Bar, which is in Gibsonton, and she met some friends there. She was supposed to meet her mother there. Apparently, it's like a family bar where a lot of people go, and, and there's televisions in there, and they just go and gather and talk. Detectives visited the Showtime bar. The bartender said she knew Tina and her mother. She confirmed that Tina had been in the bar on November 5th. The bartender also remembered that a man named Glenn was there the same night. He talked with Tina and the others. He bought a round of drinks with a $100 bill. The bartender said the man was very friendly and won Tina over quickly. Eventually, he asked Tina for a ride home. He said his motel room was close and promised Tina would be back in time to meet her mother. Everything's taken care of, right? Tina finally agreed and told the others she'd be right back. When the mother came to the Showtime bar, she sat there and waited, and her daughter didn't show up. So she said she started beeping her to find out where she was. And she said that she had such a close-knit relationship with her daughter that she immediately knew something was wrong when she didn't answer her pages. Detective Masucci also learned that Tina owned a white Ford Festiva, the same kind of car the Tampa motel manager had seen Rogers packing with suitcases. She updated the NCIC report on Rogers, adding the Festiva and its license plate number to the fugitive's information. FBI Special Agent John Huber was surprised that Rogers wasn't trying to conceal himself. Glenn Rogers seemed to not care if he would get caught or had no fear of the law. He would always use his real name when dealing with people and checking into motels. He would drive cars that weren't stolen, either belonged to the, to the victim, which he could easily be linked to, or his own vehicle. Uh, he, was a, he didn't seem to care. If people knew what was happening, he wasn't trying to hide. The search for the serial killer hit the news. TV stations across the Southeast broadcast pictures of Rogers, asking anyone spotting him to call authorities. <laughs> Hundreds of leads poured into the FBI. One promising tip came from a Jackson, Mississippi motel. Two separate callers claimed to have seen Rogers there. Rogers had been in Jackson previously and was known to frequent small motels. We uh, set up a perimeter around the hotel and then we had an entry team go up to the door. Police, come to the door. Come to the door with your hands up. Come to the door. Hands where we can see you. Agents were cautious until they could identify the man. We identified the person that resembled Rogers and determined that it was not him. We then later searched the entire hotel and began searching the hotels in the immediate vicinity 
but uh, didn't find him. It was very important in this case to apprehend this individual as soon as possible because based on his history, he was going to continue to kill until he was apprehended. Authorities were desperate to stop him. The serial killer was out there somewhere, and it was likely that he was searching for his next victim. In the fall of 1995, suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers had been last seen in Florida. The FBI believed he had murdered a woman there after killing women in California and Mississippi. The FBI soon learned that Louisiana had been his next stop. On November 10, 1995, Andy Sutton, the mother of four, was found murdered in her Bossier City, Louisiana apartment. Like two others, she had multiple stab wounds to her upper body and back. The Bossier City detective questioned the victim's roommate and former boyfriend. Andy's roommate was a waitress and had worked late the night before Andy was killed. When she returned home in the early morning hours, she heard the bedroom door close. She assumed it was Andy and her new boyfriend, Glenn Rogers, in the apartment's one bedroom. Blankets had been left on the couch, and so she slept there. After daybreak, she was awakened by someone at the apartment door. Would you tell Andy I'm here? It was Andy's ex-boyfriend. He wanted to talk to Andy. I don't care. I'd still like to see her. In the room, she found Andy's body under the sheet. She told detectives Andy had met Glenn Rogers in a bar. They had been dating for only a few days. Neighbors had seen Rogers leave in a white festiva. Bossier City detectives ran Rogers' name through the NCIC and saw the three other murder warrants. They contacted the other police agencies in the FBI. Los Angeles faxed a photo of Rogers to be used in the local investigation. Louisiana television stations picked up the story. Viewers were asked to be on the lookout for Rogers but they were warned not to approach the deadly fugitive. Special Agent John Huber and the other investigators were frustrated. Yeah, you know it. Rogers was killing people faster than we could investigate where he, where he was. Uh, it was just a, a kind of a time game, and he was killing people faster than we could apprehend him. The FBI and local detectives believed Rogers murdered four women in six weeks. After each killing, Rogers had fled the state. The locations he chose were random. Despite their best efforts, investigators couldn't keep up. They needed to spread the description of Rogers and his vehicle across the country. Agents sent requests to truckers over their CBs to be on the lookout for a white Ford for Steve. They posted wanted flyers in truck stops and rest areas. We're not really sure where you're going next. That's why uh, they held press conferences to get Rogers' photo out to the public. And Gallagher. They wanted to warn potential right now, victims is, uh, and hope someone would spot the killer. 
Through the media, agents released details of Rogers' MO for finding victims and the route he traveled. Gallagher was viciously raped and murdered. The FBI the began the process of adding Rogers to their 10 most wanted list. Uh, the rear of a Getting someone on the 10 most wanted list increases the amount of resources that the Bureau puts into a case. It also uh, increases the amount of media attention that's also uh, worked into a case. The tips began to increase. One caller claimed Glenn Rogers was at a pool hall in Mississippi. Two agents responded. One of the pitfalls of an intense media campaign are the many false sightings that well-intentioned citizens call in. The man in the bar was obviously not Rogers. The investigators tried to predict Rogers' next move and focus their search. Special Agent Huber had worked plenty of fugitive cases. A lot of times in fugitive investigations, when people are in trouble, they'll go to areas that they're familiar with or, or associates or friends. In this particular case, Rogers' family and friends were mostly located in the Kentucky area, and that's where a lot of our resources were focused. Authorities in Kentucky received priority teletypes about the fugitive. Kentucky State Police Detective Bob Stevens was already familiar with the name Glenn Rogers. In fact, he'd been looking for him for almost two years. Rogers was wanted for questioning in the disappearance and possible murder of his housemate, 71-year-old Mark Peters. Almost two years before Glenn Rogers' cross-country crime spree began, his brother had called the Kentucky State Police. The body had been found inside his family's cabin. Police believed it was Mark Peters. Peters had last been seen with Rogers. The cord tied around the corpse's hands and feet matched one found in the home the men shared. Authorities could not determine the cause of death, and they couldn't find Rogers. The case is still ongoing and still pending. Uh, we had one suspect, which was Glenn Rogers. We weren't able to track Rogers real well uh, due to the fact that he traveled by uh, Greyhound bus by tractor trailer uh, cars. It was hard for us to track him. Uh, so we had a hard time trying to know where his next step was. Still, the investigative focus in Kentucky paid off. On November 13, 1995, Glenn Rogers visited one of his relatives in Lee County, Kentucky. When he left, she called the Kentucky State Police. Hi, I think you're looking for my nephew. She said he was driving a small white car heading west toward Interstate 75. When Detective Stevens heard that Rogers was sighted nearby, he set up on the road he believed Rogers would take to I-75. It wasn't long before a white Ford Festiva drove by. The detective began following. I wanted to make sure that this was Glenn Rogers, not somebody else that I had actually fallen in behind. So I pulled out behind this car. When I ran the car tags, the car tags actually came back stolen. So I began to follow him. I was able to get up, pull up beside him like I was going to pass. When I looked over, I could see who it was. And it, the picture I had of Glenn Rogers matched the driver.
the detective requested backup. A local police officer was parked nearby. He joined the slow pursuit. They followed Rogers for a distance. I think he was kind of watching me and I was watching him. And I think by then he must have pretty much figured out that he had, he had a police officer behind him. So uh, we pulled up to a stoplight and he ran the stoplight uh, and pretty much ran some people off the road as he was going through a, the stoplight. I fell in behind him at that time and activated my emergency equipment. Rogers didn't stop, he sped up. He's on to us now. Stand by. Several miles ahead, police set up a roadblock and tried to clear the road of traffic. They hoped this would be the last stop for the elusive killer. On November 13, 1995, Kentucky State Police set up a roadblock in an effort to apprehend suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers. Armed officers waited at the roadblock. Shoot his tire! Shoot his tire! They fired at his tires, but they didn't stop the killer. Detective Bob Stevens was close behind. We followed him down the road. Uh, he had run several cars off the highway, ran a school bus off the highway. He was driving on the wrong side of the highway. And so it was determined that he had to be stopped. Sergeant Barnes would have to get up the other side of him. And when he came back, he tapped him, spun him out of the highway, off the highway into a ditch. They didn't know if the fugitive was armed. When I first approached the car, and I was one of the first ones to approach the car, uh, he, you could see that he, he looked very uh, upset, very uh, aggravated that he was in the custody. He was uh, very defiant and just didn't want to be taken into custody at that time. After a two-month killing spree that spanned the country and left four women dead, Glenn Rogers was finally in custody. The vehicle identification number of the white Festiva confirmed the car belonged to Tina Marie Cribs, the victim in Florida. Technicians scoured the car for evidence. They found shorts with blood on them blanket and a woman's purse. These and other items linked Rogers to the murders in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida. Tell me a little bit about what you guys have. The FBI served as the clearinghouse for the evidence. FBI agents and detectives from five states met in Kentucky to outline the case. Special Agent John Huber helped plan the meeting. What they did do was put together all the information that everyone had, share information, and also that the FBI laboratory would process all the evidence in this case so that one agency would have custody of all the evidence and do the analysis. Agents and detectives agreed that their best case against Rogers was in Florida. Tampa detective Julie Masucci met with detectives and prosecutors to review the evidence. They believe the watch found in the tub with the victim belonged to Rogers. A photograph of Rogers with Mississippi victim Linda Price revealed he wore that type of watch. Detective Masucci was confident in her case due to the physical evidence implicating Rogers. We had Tina Cribb's car that he was apprehended in. We had some shorts 
that belonged to him that had some of T Tina Cribb's DNA on them, the registration slip that Mr. Rogers signed himself, fingerprints that were found inside of motel room number 119 where the victim was found, and miscellaneous items that were found inside of the car when he was apprehended. On July 11th, 1997, almost two years after the murder of Tina Marie Cribbs in a Tampa motel room, Glenn Rogers was convicted of first degree murder and later sentenced to death in Florida. Two years later, Rogers was extradited to Los Angeles to stand trial for the strangulation death of Sandra Gallagher, whose body was burned in a truck fire. He poured over the victim's body and in the cab of the truck. He was seen... Prosecutors outlined the victim's final hours for the jury. They showed that Sandra and Glenn Rogers left McRed's bar together on September 28, 1995. At some point, there was a struggle, perhaps as Rogers made an unwanted sexual advance. He strangled her, crushing her windpipe. Attempting to destroy evidence, Rogers doused Sandra's body in the truck with gasoline and set it ablaze. Then he ran. On July 16, 1999, a jury again found Glenn Rogers guilty of murder. He was sentenced to a second death penalty in the state of California. Los Angeles detective Mike Koblenz was impressed by the nationwide partnership of everyone involved in the hunt for Rogers. That's really what made this case come together was the uh, interagency cooperation, and, and not just in Los Angeles, but in Jackson, Mississippi, Tampa, Florida, and later uh, Boise City, Louisiana, the FBI, the press, the different news agencies that were able to get the information out. We truly worked together on this, and, and it came to a successful conclusion down the road. Since Glenn Rogers already had two death sentences, Louisiana and Mississippi prosecutors decided to spare the families of the victims emotional trials. Glenn Rogers left at least 11 children without mothers. The importance of stopping him was clear to Detective Julie Masucci and the other investigators. As a woman, not as a detective, not as a police officer, but as a female, I think that there should be a lot of women that feel safe that he's off of the streets. He had no regard for human life. He had no regard for the feelings of the families that are left behind. He didn't care. And I'm happy that he's behind bars and I'm happy that he'll never step foot outside of a prison system that he could put other females at risk. Investigators suspect Rogers is responsible for more unsolved murder. He told family members during his rampage that he had killed dozens. And authorities continue to pursue those unsolved murders to close the cases that can be linked to Glenn Rogers. At the height of its popularity, Chippendale's exotic male dance troupe played to sell out crowds. People across the country shelled out millions to see them. Then one of the founding partners was murdered, and New York City police were left with no leads. When a suspect finally did emerge, Chase would take the FBI to another continent in the hopes of solving the backstage murder.
the 1980s, two partners created a nightclub that would bring them wealth and international fame. The male strip club phenomenon promised female patrons fun and excitement, but the bright lights hit a dark side. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The FBI would launch a sting operation spanning two continents to bring down a man who killed for profit. New York City is famous for its show business tradition. Within a four block radius of Times Square, hundreds of offices are rented by producers looking for their next hit. One such place was on the 15th floor of a building on West 40th Street. In 1987, it was home to Unicorn Productions. Nick DeNoia was its founder and president. Curiously, the five-time Emmy Award-winning children's television producer became best known as the producer and vice president of Chippendales, the exotic male dancers. On April 7, 1987, he was gunned down. Nick. A colleague heard the shot. He found Anoya dead on the floor and called 911. May I help you? Oh, yes. Uh, a man has just been shot in my office. Hold on, please. That's the connectivity ambulance service. Oh, please. Certainly. Emergency vehicles arrived moments later. NYPD crime technicians gathered evidence. They recovered a shell casing from a 9mm automatic weapon. Denoya's colleague told homicide detective Michael Geddes that a strange man had entered the office just prior to the shooting. He said a, about a, maybe about a half hour ago, uh, or 45 minutes ago, somebody came into the office and said to him, are you Nick? And he said, no, Nick is in the other office, and uh, he's busy right now. Without looking up from his work, the associate pointed the man to Denoya's office. He never saw the stranger's face. The witness told detectives that moments later, he noticed the same man in the bathroom. While he was in the bathroom, he heard this guy leaving the, the bathroom. And a couple of seconds later, he heard the door to his office open up. And then he heard a gunshot. The last sound the witness heard was the exit door to the stairwell swing open, then close. Detective Geddes traced the killer's path, hoping to find something along the way that would point to his identity. I took down uh, the route that I thought that the shooter might have taken to see if there was any evidence or anything. And I ran down the 15 floors, I believe it was. And when I got down to the end, there was two exits. One would lead to the lobby area, one would lead to the freight elevator area. So I exited out of the freight elevator area, then came back in and exited out of the lobby area just to get a, a feel for the scene. On the ground floor, detectives investigated the freight area. They dusted for prints, but were unable to lift any that were usable. The freight elevator operator had seen a man run through the door and out to the street. He recalled that the suspect wore jeans and had dark hair. He also gave us the exit of where how the fella came out of the building as he exited the uh, building on 40th Street. And when he came out, he made a left towards 8th Avenue. Upstairs, two city detectives arrived with Nick DeNoia's brother, Val, from New Jersey to identify the body. The men had been close. Val was devastated by the sight of his murdered brother. Afterwards, Val DeNoia came to the precinct to help investigators in any way he could. 
Nick's brother wanted the case solved as soon as possible. Detective Gettys hoped Val knew something that could provide a solid lead. Being a detective, one of the hardest things to do is to tell somebody, you know, that, hey, we're not going to be able to solve this case right away unless you know something that can help us. And I explained to him at that time, I said, look, if it was something that happened here in the New York area, maybe it was a business relationship here or a, uh, a relationship, a love relationship or some kind of emotional type of relationship, we have a good shot of, of solving that crime right away. For Val de Noya, one name came to mind his brother's business partner, Steve Banerjee. Banerjee had known Nick DeNoya since the early 80s. Val told the detective that his brother met him in Los Angeles. Nick DeNoya had traveled to LA hoping to build upon the success he enjoyed in New York. The five-time Emmy award-winning producer fielded many offers but one man in particular was relentless in his pursuit. Steve Banerjee, the East Indian immigrant and entrepreneur who had dreamt up Chippendale's male exotic dance review, wanted Denoya to fashion a more refined act. Though ladies only nights in LA were extremely popular, Banerjee wanted a dance troupe worthy enough to draw audiences in New York and Las Vegas. He believed that Nick DeNoya was the man who could make that dream come true. And, uh, Val DeNoya said that his brother was reluctant at first, feeling the act was too sleazy. And, uh, and when Banerjee to promised him all touring rights and 50% of its proceeds, DeNoya accepted the offer. Nick polished the routine and booked the troupe at Club Magique in New York. The newly styled Chippendales dancers became an instant hit. But shortly after his success, Val told the detective that Nick's relationship with Banerjee had soured. Banerjee demanded a larger percentage of the touring profits, but Nick refused to give in. They were always constantly arguing. And they were arguing about different ends of the business. And, you know, it's just like regular business partners, you know, but they were having trouble. And uh, Denoya was starting to take his troop out, and he was going to form a new business. He was doing very well. He wanted In the weeks prior to his death, Nick was negotiating touring deals for a troop he designed to compete directly with Chippendales. Stealing market share from Chippendales could cost Banerjee millions. Val offered the detectives his brother's financial records. NYPD set up surveillance at Nick DeNoya's funeral since detectives suspected he'd been murdered by someone he knew. Nick's brother would help identify as many mourners as possible. Nick's partner, Steve Banerjee, was among those who paid their respects. The following day, investigators phoned Banerjee in California to inquire about his relationship with his late partner. For Detective Geddes, the interview had a subtler agenda than fact-finding. We were trying to get what we call a negative interview, you know, where if he says, no, I had nothing to do with it, we were great friends, and, and things like that, just to try to disprove things that were starting to be said, so if later on it was involved with him, we could just tie it all together. You know, it's, like I said to you, it's, it's Banerjee a real never pity. contradicted what police already knew. You know, it, it, he acknowledged that he and Denoya did not get along, and admitted that he was uh, upset have, that his uh, partner uh, had formed a new you dance know, someone troupe. Who could verify that for you. Any help that I can do, officer? Banerjee do added that on April seventh, the day of the murder, he had been in Los Angeles the entire day. Yeah, yeah, you know. I, I, that did not rule out the possibility that a hitman had been hired. Thank you very much but detectives had nothing to prove it. The Denoya family offered a substantial reward for anyone who came forward with information. Police received several calls, but none panned out. We always felt this fellow, Steve Banerjee, had something to do with it, but nobody could really give us any concrete evidence or even steer us in the direction of where we could tie anybody into what happened. 
Lacking any other leads, the freight elevator operator from Denoya's building provided his description of the man he saw run from the stairwell. Though he had seen him only briefly, police hoped it would be enough to prompt someone else's memory. Pretty much. Police canvassed the lobby of Denoya's office building well into the evening. They asked everyone who worked there if they recognized the sketch. None did. The killer had apparently vanished in the middle of a workday amongst millions of New York City commuters. Well, basically, the, the investigation just, you know, it kind of hit a brick wall. And we really weren't going anywhere with it. We had a sketch that was out there. There was a reward that was out there. There was a, uh, we even put it on television, trying to get some assistance, uh, figuring if, it, you know, the person that did this was from another state that somebody would give us the information. But we constantly hit that brick wall and it wasn't going anywhere. No new leads surfaced. To New York City police, it looked as if the killer had gotten away with murder. Four years had passed since Chippendale's choreographer, Nick DeNoya, had been murdered in his Manhattan office. The case remained unsolved. Then, in July 1991, over 2,500 miles away, Special Agent Dan West at the FBI's Las Vegas field office received a call. It was from a man who claimed he had been hired to kill two people for $25,000. I immediately wasn't sure whether or not he was just a prank call. It's not unusual for uh, the FBI, especially in Las Vegas, on a weekend to receive prank calls, a lot of alcohol flowing. So I asked him to give me specific details of the alleged uh, planned uh, murder. The caller said that a man named Ray Cologne had hired him to kill two managers of a male exotic dance troupe touring England. They were competitors of the Chippendales dancers. The source said he did not know why Cologne wanted the men dead, but for some reason the would-be hitman had decided not to go through with it. I'm not sure if the source backed out because of Good Samaritan reasons or because he chickened out. He flew to, to England and then flew back to the United States almost immediately. I think he flew into Los Angeles and then drove to Las Vegas, basically to hide out. The agent told the source to meet him at the office at 5 o'clock the next morning. He needed to somehow confirm the caller's story. Um, two dancers from the he also said that he had worked with the DEA in prior investigations as, as an informant, and he provided me with the name of a DEA agent in Houston who could vouch for him. The DEA agent confirmed that he had previously worked with the source and insisted that the man was to be trusted. After the FBI arranged protection for the intended victims in England, the informant described the murder plan. Preparations were made a few days earlier at the Los Angeles home of his former landlord, Ray Colon, the man who had hired him. Colon led the would-be hitman to his garage, where they met Colon's brother-in-law, who had recently returned from scouting the victims in England. Look, man, we want this... Uh... He told the informant that he could find his targets in the town of Blackpool on July 20th, when the exotic dancers were scheduled to perform there. Because of England's strict gun laws, smuggling a gun in was out of the question. Instead, Cologne instructed the hitman to kill his victims by fatal injection. He mixed a dose of cyanide powder into a small vial. They figured it could be smuggled past customs in a bottle of eye drops. The agent needed something more solid than the Ray statement of Cologne. one informant to bring in Ray Cologne. He consented to get Cologne on tape. The reformed hitman would call Cologne and pretend that he was still in England. 
What we were trying to get from the telephone conversations was strong evidence that Cologne was a part of the plan to kill the two intended victims, if not the organizer of the plan. We had the information from the source, but we had to verify that through the tape conversations. Are you sure that damn stuff is going to work? It's pretty red, buddy. Yeah, it'll work. Oh, man, I don't want to... And if you want to add something to it... How long is it going to take before they uh, croak and hit down? Is that an immediate, if not sooner? Yeah, right. That's probably potent. You can even put a little, uh, if you want a little drain on there, if you want. Well, it's going to kill them right away, then, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was evident from the beginning that... Ray Cologne was not only a participant in this murder-for-hire scheme, but that he was actually the director of it. Cologne provided numerous suggestions to the source on how to best affect the death of these two intended victims. What wasn't evident from the recordings was a motive for killing two managers of an exotic male dance troupe. You know who hired Cologne? During the conversations, Cologne had made reference to a third man who was providing money for the double murder. But the informant told Agent West that he did not know the man's name. Two days later, on Wednesday, July 25, 1991, a federal judge in California was convinced that the FBI had enough probable cause to search Cologne's Los Angeles home. What's up? Cologne was surprised by the warrant. It limited the agent's search to cyanide, travel records to England, and correspondence that could link Cologne and his brother-in-law to the intended murder. In the bedroom, they found flyers for the male exotic dance tour in England. They also found two handguns in a drawer. Records indicated they had been legally purchased by Ray Cologne. And since the warrant didn't specify weapons, the guns were not seized. In the garage, agents did find something the warrant had specified. A bag filled with cyanide. It corroborated their informant's story. This is what he was talking Then, one agent nice found something that would break the case wide open. During the course of the search warrant, we found Cologne's address book. Special Agent Andy Stefanik from the Los Angeles office was going through that book, and he noticed the name of Steve Banerjee. Agent West also discovered that Steve Banerjee, the well-known Los Angeles owner of Chippendale's nightclub, had called Cologne recently. The toll records showed several conversations, several calls going back and forth between Banerjee and Cologne. In addition, that same day, we received the results of interviews from the British police on the intended victims, and both indicated that, that Steve Banerjee was the only person they could possibly think of who would have a motive to kill them or would even want to kill them. The two managers of the rival male dance troupe believed that Banerjee wanted them dead to stop them from competing with Chippendales. This was the same motive that New York authorities suspected was behind the murder of Banerjee's former business partner, Nick DeNoia. Agents called New York City homicide detective Michael Geddes to find out more about the five-year-old DeNoia murder. All of a sudden, I got a, a phone call from uh, the FBI. I really got excited at that point because it was already maybe five years, five and a half years or so. So it looked like we might have the opportunity to give the family their final peace. But neither the NYPD nor the FBI had direct evidence against Steve Banerjee. And agents were still unsure if Cologne would be able to assist the murder investigation. We at that time did not know whether or not Cologne was involved in the Nick DeNoia murder. The composite picture resembled Cologne, but it certainly wasn't a match. 
Despite their uncertainty about Cologne's role in Denoya's murder, they had strong evidence against him for conspiracy to commit murder. Faced with stiff jail time, the FBI believed he would talk. Cologne knew that he had to take a hit. There was no question about that. He was caught red-handed in the planning of the murder of two individuals. So he had to accept the fact that he was going to go down for some time himself, but that it was going to be a lot less time in jail if he worked with us. On August 2nd, 1991, agents arrested Cologne and his brother-in-law for conspiracy to commit murder. Cologne's arrest would increase the pressure to tell the FBI what he knew about Steve Banerjee and the murder of Banerjee's partner, Nick DeNoya. What the FBI didn't count on was that Cologne's arrest would make Chippendale's owner, Steve Banerjee, far more elusive. In August 1991, the FBI arrested Ray Colon and his brother-in-law in Los Angeles for conspiracy to commit murder. Their two targets, who escaped unharmed, were managers of a male exotic dance troupe touring England. Agents believed that a third man, Steve Banerjee, creator of Chippendales, had hired them to kill the men. Special Agent Dan West needed more than a hunch to arrest Banerjee. He hoped that Ray Cologne would provide something more solid. He knew that, uh, that his best chances of getting the best deal were to cooperate with the FBI. Uh, he had indicated to us that we only had a small fraction of the story. He took a sheet of paper and he said, right now you have this and I can give you the whole page. As agents had suspected, Cologne admitted that Steve Banerjee was the man who had hired him to carry out the murders. He also told agents that the wealthy Chippendales club owner had ordered the murder of his partner, Nick DeNoya, in New York five years before. For consideration of a lighter sentence, Cologne signed a proffer agreeing to help the FBI gather enough evidence to arrest Banerjee. Special Agent Scott Gariola from the FBI's Los Angeles field office learned that Cologne's association with Banerjee had begun by chance over a decade earlier. Cologne had lived and managed an apartment building on the same street where Chippendale's Los Angeles club was. And by being so close in proximity, he would frequent the bar and over the course of time became close friends with Banerjee. Cologne explained that his friend Steve Banerjee had immigrated to the U.S. from India in the early 70s. In 1973, the future millionaire opened a gas station north of the Los Angeles airport. He used the profits to purchase a failing West Los Angeles bar, and by 1976 had turned it into the nightclub that became famous as Chippendales. By then, Cologne had parlayed his friendship with Banerjee into employment. The out-of-work musician was happy to perform any job that Banerjee needed done. One service Cologne provided was arson. Banerjee wanted his competitors eliminated. Cologne confided that Banerjee directed him to burn down nearby competition. A disco in Santa Monica was the first target in 1979. Five years later, Cologne torched another club. Neither arson attempt had been successful and the clubs remained open. Banerjee didn't limit his targets to buildings. According to Cologne, Banerjee also ordered him to hire a hitman to kill his partner, Nick DeNoya. Cologne added that DeNoya had successfully sued Banerjee to prevent him from touring a second Chippendales dance troupe. The lawsuit, combined with costly merchandising overruns, forced Banerjee to file for bankruptcy. As instructed, 
Cologne hired a hitman three months earlier. Right off the street. He claimed he remembered only the man's first name, which was Louis. On the day of the murder, Cologne and Louis flew in from LA, rented a car, and drove into Manhattan. Cologne waited on the street with the engine running until Louis returned from shooting Denoya. The following night, Cologne was back in Los Angeles. In Chippendale's parking lot, Banerjee paid Cologne $12,000 cash, the balance of the original $25,000 fee. Cologne's story was good, but it was only hearsay from a suspected conspirator. He might say anything to serve less jail time. Special Agent Gariola first needed to verify the facts Cologne had presented. At this point, all we had was somebody in prison telling us, well, it wasn't me, it was somebody else who was behind it. Your initial plan is to corroborate as much as possible what he's telling you. And, and that's what we did for the first couple of months. With Cologne's credibility secured, the FBI set out to get Banerjee and the hitman who killed his partner. Agents figured the only one Banerjee would trust enough to confess to would be his old friend, Ray Cologne. But they needed to get Cologne close enough. We had Cologne released out of uh, the jail where he was being housed under a, uh, a proposed uh, medical furlough because of his health problems. And we started sending uh, communications to Banerjee via letter, messenger, messenger delivered letters, and cryptic phone calls to try and get Banerjee to respond to him. Banerjee refused to return calls or letters. He was suspicious of Cologne, despite having paid him over $200,000 at various drops around the city to keep Cologne loyal since his arrest. The FBI came up with another plan to compel Banerjee to respond to Cologne. We decided to force the issue and uh, set up a meeting on our own terms. And we had Cologne waiting across the street from Chippendales one morning. As agents watched, Cologne called to Banerjee when he emerged from the club. The Chippendales owner was curious as to why Cologne was standing outside his establishment. Banerjee spoke to him in whispers, suspecting he may be wired. Agents had no way of knowing what Banerjee might be planning. We took several precautions. Uh, you know, if he, if he hired somebody else, Cologne, to kill somebody, why wouldn't he hire somebody to kill Cologne? Hoping to strengthen Banerjee's trust, the released prisoner provided the address of a bar where the suspected murderer was to send more money. Banerjee didn't trust Cologne, but he couldn't afford to ignore him. He told Cologne to pick up his payment the next evening. Agents set up surveillance on the bar. At about 9 o'clock, agents observed Banerjee stopping in front, checking the address, and then driving away. A short time later, a messenger delivered a package. Agents retrieved it from inside. When we contacted the messenger company that had sent the package, the pickup location where the package was received from was a bakery that was right next door to the building where the Chippendales dancers were practicing and rehearsing. Back in the FBI offices, agents opened the package, not knowing what might be inside. It contained $14,000. I guess we got The payoff meant that Banerjee would continue to keep Ray Cologne close to him. But agents didn't know if Banerjee would talk or if the hitman, known only as Louis, would ever be found. In the summer of 1992, FBI agents continued to surveil Chippendale's club owner, Steve Banerjee. He was suspected of ordering the murder of his partner more than five years earlier. Ray Cologne, hired by Banerjee to arrange the murder, 
had been arrested and was cooperating with agents to capture the wealthy club owner. Wearing a wire, Cologne met the East Indian entrepreneur at a hotel in Santa Monica, hoping to get his confession on tape. Special Agent Scott Gariola and his team were stationed nearby. Banerjee uh, immediately motioned for Cologne to join him in the men's room. Uh, when the two of them went into the men's room, and Banerjee uh, told him to be quiet, not to say a word, he searched Cologne about three times looking for the wire. Agents worried about what the suspected murderer might do to Cologne if he found the wire. Cologne's life depended on the FBI's skills at concealment. Banerjee never found the wire, right. but it was clear that he did not completely trust his longtime friend, Ray Colon. Out in the lobby, Banerjee insisted they communicate through notes instead of speaking. Agents recorded only scribbles and whispers. Banerjee wanted to know how much Colon had told the FBI and what they knew about, quote, the deed. Cologne knew the deed referred to the murder of Banerjee's partner. The former musician denied that he had said anything to federal agents. Once again, we were unsuccessful in getting a uh, audible recording due to the fact that Banerjee basically whispered throughout the whole thing and wrote notes. And when Cologne would raise his voice and try and talk, Banerjee would, uh, would shush him, basically by putting his uh, finger to his mouth and saying, no, we can't talk. Banerjee gathered the notes and returned to the restroom, this time alone. Despite his doubts about Cologne's loyalty, Banerjee handed him another payment, this time in plain view of agents. The package held $30,000, more than twice as much as the first. Unfortunately for investigators, there was nothing illegal about giving Cologne cash. On its face, it's basically a loan for attorney fees for, for Cologne. Without the, without the story on tape of how Cologne and Banerjee were partners in these crimes, the money basically was not going to be able to, uh, to do anything for the case. After Banerjee's Mercedes was out of sight, agents hoped to retrieve at least a portion of the notes from the meeting. In the men's room, under the toilet, one agent discovered a scrap of paper. It seemed that Banerjee had flushed the rest. Though it held only a small pen mark, it would help corroborate Cologne's story when it came time to testify at trial. Cologne did not remember the full name of the hitman he had hired in 1987, but he did recall that his first name was Louie, and he lived somewhere in East Los Angeles. Cologne didn't have a last name for him, didn't have an address. We had uh, took him out a couple of times, had him drive us around the area, and he uh, pointed out a house that he thought Louis had lived in. Cologne's memory proved correct. The woman who answered the door was Louis's mother. Since she did not know Cologne, she refused to tell him where her son was. Cologne told her that he wanted to provide work for him and handed her his card. In a few days, Cologne received a call. Unfortunately, what we came across was uh, Louis's brother, Andy, and uh, we had to establish a relationship with Andy to try and find out where Louis was. So we had Cologne um, talking to Andy about various things. He, you know, he needed to hire Louis back for a job, uh, same job he had, uh, he had completed a few years prior. After about a month, Andy finally told Cologne that he could find his brother, Roberto Rivera Lopez, in Los Angeles' county prison. Rivera, whose nickname was Louie, was serving time for possession of narcotics and would be out of jail in a few months. As a heroin junkie, 
He would need fast cash after his release and wanted to know more about Cologne's offer. Cologne laid the groundwork once again for this uh, new job that he, he wanted uh, Rivera to help him with. And the plan what, that we had set in motion was that there was a witness to the homicide in 1987 and that uh, Louis needed to go back and take care of that witness. Near the end of 1992, Cologne met with the hitman for the first time in five years. With their conversation being monitored, the FBI informant slowly drew Louis Rivera in, detailing a new murder plot. If the FBI ever hoped to get the hitman confessing on tape, it had to be now. His release date on the uh, charge he was incarcerated for was, uh, I believe, January 17th of 93. We were running up against the clock. And uh, one of our concerns was that, uh, you know, we had laid the groundwork for uh, Cologne and Rivera, that when Rivera got out, he was supposed to contact Cologne to go and, uh, and kill this witness. Agents' worries were laid to rest. On Christmas Eve, 1992, Rivera described his role in the murder of Nick DeNoya. At 3.30 p.m. on April 7, 1987, Louis arrived on the 15th floor of DeNoya's building disguised as a messenger. The place was empty except for one man in the outer office. Moments later, when the office worker entered the men's room, Louis exited to kill DeNoya, figuring there'd be no other witnesses to the crime. He found the producer at his desk, pulled out a 9mm semi-automatic, and fired from three feet away. The FBI had it all on tape. Ray Cologne had fulfilled half of his agreement with the FBI to receive sentencing consideration on his charge of conspiracy to commit murder. The other half hinged on his ability to secure a taped confession from the man who had ordered DeNoya's murder, his longtime friend, Steve Banerjee. So far, more than a year after his arrest, Cologne had been unable to do that. By January 1993, the FBI's cooperating witness, Ray Cologne, had been unable to convince murder suspect Steve Banerjee to discuss aloud the crimes they had planned together. They had met several times, but Banerjee had been too paranoid or too clever to be recorded. At one meeting, Banerjee suggested he'd help Cologne hide out overseas. Special Agent Scott Gariola and his team used Banerjee's suggestion to form a new plan. Perhaps Banerjee could be lured overseas to talk to Cologne on foreign soil. I don't think it was too difficult on uh, Banerjee's part to accept the fact that Cologne was going to go overseas. I mean, he wanted to be rid of Cologne. Uh, he knew Cologne was the only person that could tie him into these uh, various, uh, various crimes dating back to 1979. Since Cologne was still on Banerjee's payroll, agents believed it was likely that he would visit Cologne in person to be certain that Cologne had what he needed for an extended stay. Banerjee wanted Cologne out of his life permanently. The FBI selected Rome as their destination, since Italy's laws and police force are well adapted to surveillance investigations. Agents made extensive preparations before they arrived. We acquired a, uh, a phony United States passport for Cologne in, in, in an alias name, which you would expect someone who's on the run, a fugitive in another country, to have some kind of phony documentation. So we, we uh, acquired that. We also entered Cologne into the uh, nationwide crime computer as a fugitive. So in the event uh, Banerjee had some kind of uh, private investigator or someone check the computer, uh, it would show that there was a warrant out for Cologne's rest because he, he was now a fugitive. 
With the cooperation of the Italian authorities, the FBI secured an apartment for Cologne in Rome that was wired for recording. When everyone was assembled, Cologne placed a call to Banerjee in California. The East Indian murder suspect understood that Cologne would use the code name Mr. Underwood when he called. There was a problem with Banerjee coming to Rome since he was not a United States citizen. Uh, he claimed he was not able to obtain a visa in time to enter Italy. And uh, he wanted initially to meet us up uh, by the Italian-Swiss border. Banerjee finally agreed to meet Cologne in Zurich, Switzerland. The FBI had only a short time to make the new arrangements. It was quite a challenge uh, to get everything accomplished. Uh, basically, this was a Friday, I believe, and it was basically one day since no one worked on a weekend back in the States. We had to get every, everything, all the necessary approvals for the travel, the country clearance. We had to get the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to contact, uh, through a mutual legal assistance treaty, contact the, their counterparts in Switzerland to get the authority, the legal authority, to do the consensual uh, recordings. Uh, it was quite arduous, to say the least. Despite the brief turnaround time, the FBI and Swiss authorities would be ready. The plan was to wire Cologne for a meeting in the hotel lobby. Afterwards, the informant would suggest continuing the meeting in his hotel room, which would be equipped with audio and video devices planted by a special unit of the Swiss police. Two adjoining rooms were booked in a downtown Zurich hotel. One room they wired for picture and sound. The room next door would hold the monitoring equipment. Agents hoped that this time, their efforts would finally be rewarded with Banerjee's confession on tape. From the time of his arrival at the Zurich airport, Steve Banerjee would be under constant police surveillance. The plan was for Cologne to call Banerjee and arrange a meeting in another hotel late in the afternoon. As planned, Banerjee arrived first. Undercover agents and Swiss police were stationed throughout the hotel, dressed as staff. He waited in the bar, where he was expecting Cologne's call. On cue, the phone rang. Cologne was on his way. This was the FBI's best chance to get the recording they had long awaited. To be sure Banerjee's voice was taped clearly, they hid the wire inside Cologne's outermost layer of clothing, his coat. But Cologne seemed nervous and removed his coat when he arrived. As a result, investigators could no longer hear the conversation. Years of pursuit hung in the balance. It seemed unlikely that Banerjee would agree to meet Cologne again anytime soon. We had ourselves a major problem. So what I initially did was, since I was monitoring the conversation from the outside, I went into the, uh, into the, uh, the doorway of the restaurant, and hopefully in Cologne's point of, uh, line of eyesight, and I took my jacket off a couple of times, hoping he would get the idea to put his jacket on. But the agent couldn't get Cologne's attention. The informant was apparently too nervous to look anywhere except directly at Banerjee. 
the Swiss police, they came to our rescue. They went in there and they closed the whole restaurant down. They went in and talked to the, uh, the owner of the, the manager of the restaurant and said, hey, we got a little problem. Well, we need to shut this restaurant down. Uh, fortunately, there weren't too many customers in there. And um, basically, they it closed the restaurant down, which forced Cologne and Banerjee to leave the restaurant. After moving to a noisier bar in the hotel, Cologne suggested they'd be more comfortable relaxing in the room where Cologne was staying. Cologne arrived first. He was met by a Swiss technician who attempted to strip the wire from his jacket before Banerjee arrived. Cologne's device was an unnecessary risk since the room itself was wired. We didn't know what Banerjee was going to do once the two of them were in the hotel. They had gone from a public place to strictly a private place, and we were a little concerned at this point for what Banerjee may have up his sleeve. Undercover agents alerted the surveillance team that Banerjee had arrived on Cologne's floor. The Swiss tech retrieved the wire and stepped into the adjoining room. Okay. Cologne barely had time to pour himself a drink before there was a knock on the door. The first thing Banerjee did was check Cologne for wires. He found none and began to relax. Cologne poured him a drink. Then his old friend opened up. Banerjee felt comfortable enough to talk about murdering his partner. He mentioned the $25,000 he paid to commission the deed. He also made comments about the men in England that he ordered killed. He even talked to Cologne about the arsons he had paid for back in 1979. After five and a half years and 6,000 miles from the crime scene, the FBI's perseverance had finally paid off. At last, they had it all on tape, and Cologne earned himself an early parole. That was the, the coup de grace right there. That was it. We got, we got exactly what we needed. Uh, we pretty much corroborated Cologne, you know, down to every I, dotted I, and every T that Cologne had told us. On September 2nd, 1993, outside his Chippendales Club in Los Angeles, Steve Banerjee was arrested for racketeering and first-degree murder. Facing life in prison, Banerjee's defense team offered the state's attorneys terms for an agreement. Banerjee would plead guilty to the charges and forfeit his interest in Chippendales for consideration in sentencing. New York State accepted, suggesting 26 years in a maximum security facility. But to Banerjee, the punishment was too severe. On the day of his sentencing in October 1994, he was found hanged in his cell. Michael Geddes, the New York City detective who investigated Nick DeNoia's murder six years earlier, was glad to see the case closed. Ever since Steve Banerjee was arrested and Cologne confessed, what happened is I saw that Val Denoya, the brother, and his wife actually change. You could see the peace in their face. You could see the smile coming back into their life. Steve Banerjee had immigrated to the United States to fulfill his dreams of success. Blinded by his pursuit, he confused power and the accumulation of wealth with the American dream. 